All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight to our second and hopefully a long series of Men of God. So again, we're trying to get guys to get together, to hear good talks from good presenters, trying to build up our church through the men to be good spiritual leaders for their families and for our church. So last month, December, Father Joseph kicked us off with a great talk on how to celebrate Christmas as a Christian. That vi- our audio will have been recorded, and it will be available once the new church website is out, which is still hasn't happened yet. So, But you will be able to share that audio and listen to that at a later date. Um, tonight, unfortunately, Father Ben Little wasn't able to be with us. He sends his apologies for not being able to make it, but thanks be to God, Father Paul Haverstock, who is a great fill-in, was willing to step right in there, even on a shorter notice. So thank you so much, Father Paul. He's going to be talking tonight, right what with what Father Ben was planning on talking about, about the place of silence, and I will let you talk about what you were wanting to talk about. So let's hear it for Father Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan, former worthy Grand Knight of this great Knights of Columbus Council here at Holy Family. Very glad to be with you tonight. And when I found out that uh, Father Ben Little wouldn't be able to give this talk, uh, I had the option of either proposing a new topic or just sticking with what he had already proposed, which was the power of silence. And I don't know. I didn't really have any better ideas, but I also don't know anything about silence. Uh, And so, fortunately, what I'm going to share with you tonight are not my own thoughts about this important subject, but rather the thoughts of holier men who do know something about the value of silence in the spiritual life. So I will be the dwarf standing on their shoulders and uh, will trust in the motto that plagiarism is the highest form of flattery. Um, And I'd like to begin with a quote from a book that was recently published by Robert Cardinal Serra, or actually I think it's maybe pronounced Serra, um, he is currently the, um, the prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship, which means that he is in charge of regulating the liturgy of the Catholic Church, so he holds a very important position. And uh, he's a very contemplative and deep soul. And this is just a little sentence quote from, uh, from this neat book. He says, Our world no longer hears God because it is constantly speaking at a devastating speed and volume, in order to say nothing. Modern civilization does not know how to be quiet. My main source for the talk tonight will not be Cardinal Serra's book, um, although I will have a few quotes from it. My main source is a book called Silence, a series of conferences given by a Camaldolese hermit, which was published in 2010. And if you've never heard of the Kamal Delis order before, they are a cloistered contemplative order, which is similar to the Carmelites, such as the community that we have in Lake Elmo, Minnesota, uh, and probably other communities that I'm not aware of as well. So they don't leave their monastery very often, and they practice uh, a very strict silence most of the day, as well as an austere diet, and they devote themselves to very frequent periods of prayer, including vigils at night. This story may help to illustrate the point about who the Kamal Delis are. Once upon a time, a young rich man thought God might be calling him to embrace a life of poverty and enter religious life. And so he decided to visit a few different religious orders. He called up the Jesuits to arrange a visit, and they told him they would be happy to provide him with first-class airfare to their novitiate house out east. He was surprised and said, First class? Don't you take a vow of poverty? The Jesuit replied, hey, we're not Franciscans. And so the young man then called the local Franciscans to schedule a visit, and they told him they would be happy to pick him up and have their driver come. But when the car pulled up, the boy was surprised to see that it was a Mercedes, and so he asked the brother driving it, you drive a Mercedes? Don't you take a vow of poverty? To which the Franciscan replied, hey, we're not Kamal Delis. And... Finally, the young man called up the Kamal Delis and asked to visit, and the monk who answered the phone informed him that he would be most welcome, but he asked if he would come sooner rather than later and bring some groceries with him since the community lives off of donations and had run out of food two weeks before. (laughs) And so the young man knew he had found his order. So, But you may be wondering, what do the Kamal Delis have to say to us normal 
men who live in the world, who are not monks or hermits, and who do not spend most of our time uh, living in a state of prayer and silence. But one of the great benefits to the church of the contemplative orders, in other words, the religious orders that dedicate their time not to an active apostolate like teaching or like Mother Teresa's order of serving the poor, but rather that dedicate themselves to prayer and often in the context of a cloister where they do not leave uh, during the year, one of the great benefits we get out of those orders as a church is that we get to receive the wisdom that they learn and glean from their deep spiritual lives so that they can bring that back to share with us, because all of us have to be faithful to our own state in life. Uh, A married man is not called to be a hermit. A diocesan priest who's in the world is not called to live the life of a Kamal Deliz, but we can look to them and still learn some really important principles for our life as well. So the topic tonight is the power of silence. And first of all, we should begin by defining our terms and asking, well, what is silence? And in reading this book by the Kamal Deliz, I learned that uh, certainly from the, those who have an advanced spiritual life, silence is much more than just being quiet or the absence of noise. They would call that exterior silence. And exterior silence is something that we don't always have very much control over. Sometimes we do when we're in the car. We can turn off the radio or when we're uh, seeing a whole bunch of ads on TVs, we can turn off the TV or whatever. But... Um, But it's not the most important kind of silence for the spiritual life. The most important kind, which is what I'm going to be spending most of my time talking about tonight, is what the monks call interior silence. And there are at least five kinds of interior silence, which correspond to our five senses. For example, there is silence of the eyes, uh, which involves quieting our power of vision so that we only look at what is good for our souls. For each of our five senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell, there is a corresponding kind of silence. I wouldn't have thought that you could say a lot looking at silence this way, but after reading this book by the Kamal Deliz monk, I realized there is actually a very rich uh, spiritual gold mine here that is very relevant for all of us who are living in the modern world. And I hope you'll agree with me as we go through uh, these, these different kinds of silence tonight. And all of, these, all of this, these types of silence have something valuable to teach us about our relationship with God. So in this talk, I will briefly explore each of the five types of interior silence. The silence of the eyes, the silence of the ears, of the tongue, of the hands, and of the nose. The nose will be the shortest of the five for sure. And we will also look briefly at exterior silence, uh, in other words, the importance of taking time away from the chaos and din of modern life. And I'm just going to take a note of the time right now. I think we started about five minutes ago, so I'm going to say 45 minutes would be about 8.10 is what I'm hoping to end. Okay. And uh, as we discuss each type of silence, uh, I will conclude each of those different sections with some practical tips inspired by the monks here of how we might be able to grow in our relationship with God by embracing some aspect of each of these each of these k- kinds of silence. And just two initial observations to begin this talk. First, modern life is profoundly lacking in silence. We already heard that from Cardinal Seurat just a second ago, but it hardly needs to be said. We all know this from our experience that uh, life is literally filled with sounds and images and distractions and all kinds of things which draw our attention away from what is truly important. Uh, Just a few examples, obviously things like smartphones by themselves give us access to email, Facebook, texts, Games, Snapchatting, checking the weather time 10 times a day. We have computers, TV, internet, Netflix, music, Muzak. We have 24-7 grocery stores, 24-7 news, more and more books that have less and less to say. Commercials, billboards, politics, endless debates, light pollution, noise pollution, air pollution. Why is our world so noisy? And Cardinal Seurat says, and I'm going to be quoting Cardinal Seurat and the monks quite a bit, as well as my favorite uh, practical saint, Saint Jose Maria Escrivá, the founder of Opus Dei, who wrote a wonderful collection of works called The Way, Furrow, 
and The Forge, which were published in a single collection, which I didn't bring with me, but I have typed out here, um, highly recommended for your own spiritual edification, Jose Maria Escriva, especially The Way. But Cardinal Serra says in his book here, silence is not a virtue, noise is not a sin, true, but... The turmoil and confusion and constant noise of modern society are the expression of the ambiance of society's greatest sins, its godlessness and its despair. A world of propaganda, of endless argument, or simply of chatter is a world without anything to live for. In other words, we are restless, which is not itself a sin, but it is a symptom As St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. So the first observation is that modern life is profoundly lacking in silence. Second initial observation is just to say that without silence, we cannot hear God. And that's why silence is an important topic that we're talking about tonight. Cardinal Serra says, God speaks in silence. And this is not only him speaking, but the entire tradition of the Catholic Church. And really, even the entire mystical tradition of world religions at, at as a whole, um, you will never find a religion that promotes an immersion in sound and chaos in order to draw closer to their divinity. Everybody knows that there's a certain level of recollection and of uh, internalization and of quieting of the self that allows one to become more in contact with the important questions and the important realities. Again, just uh, one last quote from Cardinal Seurat on this point. The desire to see God is what urges us to love silence and solitude, for silence is where God dwells. He drapes himself in it. So that's why we're talking about it tonight. The first of the five kinds of interior silence, buckle up, that we're going to talk about is the silence of the eyes. Cardinal Seurat, for some years now, there has been a constant onslaught of images, lights, and colors that blind man, his interior dwelling, is violated by the unhealthy and provocative images of pornography, bestial violence, and all sorts of worldly obscenities that assault purity of heart and infiltrate through the door of sight. In the cities that shine with a thousand lights, Our eyes no longer find restful areas of darkness, and consciences no longer recognize sin. With each of the five senses that we're going to be talking about, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, um, we have to remember that all of them are good. Everything that God gave us as part of our created being is good. And so nothing in this talk should be construed to be saying that we need to uh, rebel against the way God made us or that what he gave us is bad. Rather, we live in a fallen world, and so there's that temptation to misuse the good things that we've received. That's really the point of what's going to be said here. So sight, for example, is a great gift from God, but it's also dangerous. And St. Jose Maria Escriva in The Way says, The eyes, through them, much wickedness enters the soul. How many experiences like David's with Bathsheba? There are two ways to use our sight. We can praise God by what we see, or by seeing we can offend God as well. Uh, One issue that immediately comes to mind when we're thinking about the silence of the sight, and when we say silence of the sight, silence of hearing, you can even think the discipline of the sight. Really what we're talking about is disciplining our interior movements and our interior senses so that we can have that stillness which allows us to see God. Uh, When we're talking about the discipline of the sight, one issue that obviously comes up for us as men, but for all people living in uh, in the 21st century, is pornography, uh, which is a plague upon our culture and the church. It's not the worst sin. The worst sin certainly would be something closer to pride, um, but it is an extremely harmful sin. And What's worse about pornography is that it's a sin that's often not confessed, either because people are embarrassed by it and don't want to bring it to the sacrament, or else uh, because they simply, we simply don't go to the sacrament anyway. We simply don't go to confession to receive forgiveness. Or we go once a year and make a token confession, but never allow that to begin to transform our lives. It's a very serious problem. And in that case, pornography becomes a deadly poison, like all mortal sins, which, if unconfessed, can certainly lead us to hell. 
By the way, victory in this area is certainly possible, but it can only be won by men who know how to flee the occasions of sin, which is exactly where discipline of sight is so important. Men who know how to flee the occasions and to get back up again after a fall, especially by going to confession. And I wanted to just, uh, this is a little mini tangent, but I do want to quote St. Jose Maria Escriva. So his book, The Way, is just a collection of um, advice that he gave to his spiritual directees, um, various directees that he had throughout his life. He was a mentor to many people. And so he just takes these little snippets out of letters that he might have written and then collects them and organizes them by various topics. Um, and that's what he does in all three of his books, The Way, Furrow, and The Forge. And uh, in The Way, under the heading of uh, Holy Purity, he has a whole lot of really great stuff. Um, but these were just some that stood out to me that could possibly be helpful for this reflection. And to think that for the satisfaction of a moment which left you, which left in you dregs of bitterness, you have lost the way. The satisfaction of a moment. Or again, many live like angels in the midst of the world. Why not you? To defend his purity, St. Francis of Assisi rolled in the snow. St. Benedict threw himself into a thorn bush. St. Bernard plunged into an icy pond. You, what have you done? And finally, there is need for a crusade of manliness and purity to counteract and undo the savage work of those who think that man is a beast. And that crusade is a matter for you. St. Jose Maria Escriva really has a gift for calling us out to embrace the life of holiness and to step up to the plate because we really have to. The main thing is to put our eyes to good use, though. It's not just about avoiding the bad, but even using them for good. And there will be times when we should say yes to looking at the marvels of God's creation. In fact, all the time we have these opportunities. I love it when I used to be driving on 494 eastbound early in the morning, getting to see the sun rising as I would come over the hills and marveling at the beauty of God's creation there. But there's so many opportunities in our wonderful state where we, whether you go out and fish or hunt or happen to enjoy just going for long walks or skiing or whatever it might be, um, we're surrounded by God's beauty and we should use our eyes to appreciate these things. Another great way that we can use our vision in in a disciplined way is like Our Lady at the Wedding Feast of Cana who saw the needs of of others. This is a quote from, uh, from the monks, from the Kamaldolese monks. It is amazing to see how some people see everything and find what they desire to have for themselves, but they cannot see the needs of others. For us, especially for you men who are married, uh, some obvious practical applications to this principle come to mind about seeing the needs of others. Uh, with your wives, for example, helping out with the dishes in the kitchen, uh, a very basic thing, serving food, doing the chores around the house. Even when we're out on the road, this applies to me as well, being a considerate driver. Um, sometimes, you know, you got that car at the intersection that's just a little bit too far over to the right, and he's blocking the right turn lane so that nobody else can go. It's a pretty random exam- example, but it's an example of how we can just be more aware Uh, in our daily lives of of thinking about the other people who are around us and not just thinking about ourselves and asking, what can I do to actually be serving other people uh, where I am? A general rule of thumb for how to exercise discipline in the power of sight, if something makes prayer more difficult, we should avoid looking at it. Uh, I was once told by a very holy uh, nun that it is impossible to pray and to sin. And... It's actually a very helpful guiding principle for a lot of things. One thing it's a helpful principle uh, for remembering is that if we continue to persevere in prayer, no matter what struggles uh, or what sins we may be dealing with, as long as we don't give up praying, never, as long as we never give up praying, ultimately the sins that we struggle with will be overcome by God's grace. But the key is that we can't give up, and we can't give up too early in the fight especially. And that's the temptation to think that we're not making progress, or that prayer doesn't accomplish anything. But I believe this holy sister was right, that if we actually persevere in prayer, uh, ultimately prayer and sin can't coexist, and therefore we persevere in prayer, the sin eventually does go away. 
some practical tips, um, practical application. So, I guess we've already sort of said these, but uh, on the positive hand, uh, use your eyes to look for ways to help others. On the negative side, absolutely reject anything that leads to evil or anything that even comes close to leading us to evil. St. Jose Maria Escriva says, don't be a coward and try to be brave. Run. And that's the advice that all of us have to take heed of when it comes to, especially the battle for purity. We have to imitate Joseph, who ran from Potiphar's wife instead of trying to convince her that she was mistaken that an extramarital affair would be a good idea. That would have been a very foolish way to approach the problem. Instead, we have to run. That's the first kind of silence, the silence of sight. The second kind of silence is the silence of hearing, the silence of the ears. And just like sight, hearing is a great gift from God. The ear is a little masterpiece of God, as the monk observed. And uh, I really like this one, and I guess this is a common phrase, but has a wonderful spiritual application, which is that, you know, we have two ears, but only one tongue. And that is a clue for the proper ratio of hearing to speaking that we should be engaging in. In fact, it would be a good reflection for all of us at some point today or soon to just ask ourselves in conversation and even to be paying attention the next time we are in a conversation, who's doing most of the talking and what is it about? Is it about interest in what maybe the other person is, has going on in their lives, uh, following up on the topics that they've raised in conversation, trying to continue a conversation for an extended period of time that, that may be interesting to them, or do we simply tend to immediately turn the conversation to what we find interesting, uh, or to talk about ourselves, worse yet? Um, we only have two ears. We have two ears, but only one tongue. We see this especially in the news when we have these political debates and politics and the news and people who just disagree with each other and instead of ever actually having a deep conversation about the principles behind the issues they debate, uh, we simply have a talking past each other all the time. It's a, very frust it's a frustrating experience for all of us. And uh, again, like all of our senses, hearing can also be used for good, of course. Faith comes from hearing, as St. Paul says. Faith comes from hearing. On the other hand, listening to the wrong person or influence can also lead us down the wrong path. Adam and Eve fell because of who they listened to. And so the Apostle John, recognizing the importance of being discerning in how we use that gift of hearing, recommends that we test every spirit, 1 John 4, 1. Test every spirit. There are many people, even in the church, who follow errors or even promote them. We have to be discerning. And we can be sure that we're doing well if we do listen to God and if we do stay faithful to the church and what she teaches. We can be sure that we're in danger of straying when we start to take issue uh, with church teaching and start to think that we know better than Holy Mother Church does, which is a, a reality which is, goes very contrary to 21st century ideals of personal autonomy and thinking that I should be the master of my own destiny. But I know that among this group, it's a safe assumption that uh, we probably are not actively dissenting on many issues of the church, but we should be humble in that as well and, uh, and be careful. Some practical thoughts about the gift of hearing. Uh, like we already said on the positive side, listen more than you speak. Uh, this could be a great gift for your marriage, husbands. Um, I know from hearsay and from, from other reports <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that wives love a listening ear, and don't we all? Even in regular conversation, again, trying to let the other person lead and being interested in what they bring up, rather than shifting to your own favorite subjects right away. On the negative side, to reject voices that speak against God or the church, and I think this is especially where discernment comes in, being, discernment in, uh, being discerning in what you read. Even among good Catholics, I would say that even we fall into the trap of listening to the sound bites in the news, which can be very discouraging and also very misleading often enough. I think especially when it comes to the reporting of church news, it's very important that we make the effort not to just read the headlines on blogs or in whatever newspaper we might happen to enjoy, um, but instead if we're going to be discussing what 
the Holy Father says, what a bishop says, what some random Catholic says, we should at least do them the courtesy of reading their own words uh, unfiltered by, by the newspapers in context before we make a judgment about that. That's not always easy. I'm guilty of being rash in that, I have to admit. But uh, like I said at the beginning, I'm not preaching what I do. I'm preaching what you should do. <laughs> so there you go. Although I will say that in researching this talk, I am inspired to try to do better. So please, God. That is the second kind of silence, the silence of the ears, silence of hearing. third kind of silence is the silence of taste. Like all of our senses, again, taste is a good thing, and it's a gift from God. Without taste, there would be no delight in Snuffy's malt shop, in a nice porterhouse steak, a nice bottle of red wine, a nice uh, Michelob golden light. But like all our senses, it can be misused. St. John Cashin, raise your hand if you've ever heard of St. John Cashin before. Okay, we got three hands back there. Do either of you, can either of you say anything about St. John Cashin? Huh? Heard of him, don't remember? Excellent, excellent. A short bio, can't remember. He's kind of, huh? He's in heaven. <laughs> Excellent answer. He is in heaven. He was a desert father, uh, and uh, so he, he lived a very ascetical life in the early church. I don't, know, I don't know when he lived. I don't know hardly anything about him either. I, I don't know why I decided to ask that question. But anyway, he, he was one of the guys who lived in the deserts and sought out that wisdom of living a life in solitude and in true silence. And when it came to the, uh, the sense of taste, he had this to say. He said, um, it's sort of like uh, our, our hunger and our appetite and, and how we decide to give into it is sort of like an eagle, which when it soars high above the ground is quite safe and sees very far. But it gets into danger when it comes low to look for food. And we too can be caught by the spirit of gluttony and led into worse things. Interestingly, there's a, uh, there seems to be a very strong connection in the moral life. Uh, as St. Jose Maria Escriva points out, Gluttony is the forerunner of impurity. In other words, when we give in to our sort of more basic desires, it tends to connect up with other basic desires and leads us perhaps down roads that we ought not to go. So just to talk about the sin of gluttony for a moment, which is not a sin that one necessarily hears very often in the confessional, but probably is one that is committed more often than we would think. Uh, traditionally, there are four types of gluttony that can be identified or four subcategories. Uh, eating when we don't need to, seeking out the best food for ourselves, and this can include always buying the richest foods, but it can also include taking that best piece from the sort of common plate there, um, overeating, and then uh, fressin, which is, I'm sure my dad could tell us the difference between essen and fressin, which is a distinction that exists in the German language. Dad, do you know what fressin means? That's right. Fressen is what an animal does when it consumes food, whereas essen is what a human being does when he eats food. So fressen would be eating like an animal. In other words, having no table manners at all. If you've ever seen the movie The Lord of the Rings, the trilogy, then in the second of the three, I think, the steward of Gondor, Denethor, who's a kind of evil guy, there's this horrible scene where He's uh, having one of the hobbits sing for him as there's this battle going on outside and the city's about to fall and he's completely willfully ignoring the problem because he's just kind of insane. But he's just scarfing down this food and he eats this cherry tomato and it pops in his mouth and it's just flowing down. Next time you watch the movies, look for that. I think that's a good example of the sin of gluttony. But uh, it also reminds me of another story. When I was in Italy doing my seminary, I spent a summer in, on the island of Sardinia with a, a very good and holy priest. And one time we were eating lunch, and I made the mistake of uh, using a finger from my other hand to sort of scoop up food onto my fork. And he just stopped eating and stared at me for a few moments in silence. And he just broke into a laugh, and he said, You come from the deep, deep woods, okay? <laughs> So that's something you never forget, and I've never, I try not to use my fingers anymore when I'm using my fork. But St. Paul says, whether you eat or drink, 
Do it all for the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10.31. There is no absolute rule for how much we should eat uh, or drink, and it's different for each person. But there are two extremes, especially when it comes to food. And some people eat less than they actually need, which is probably a rarer problem, but it's also more common today than it perhaps was 50 years ago at a time when uh, a shortage of food was, was a much greater problem than an abundance of food, which is what we enjoy now. Most of us, on the other hand, tend to the other extreme, which is to eat too much rather than too little. So these are some great tips from the monks. Uh, I think I did bring their book. I'll show it to you at the end of the talk, um, this book uh, by the monks. And these are three tips they have for how to eat well. They say, always eat a little of what you dislike. Uh, On a recent retreat that I was on, the monks... Uh, at the place where I was, made an egg and broccoli kind of soupy casserole with cheese. And it was basically like the personification of everything I don't like in food. And I didn't didn't eat any, and I just passed it on. And I realized when I read this that I probably should have taken a small piece to be polite. But um, always eat a little of what you dislike. Second, always make some mortification at the table. Mortification is a fancy word for saying no to yourself and your desires. In other words, saying, down boy, you know, I don't need to take that extra piece of pie or I could just take a little bit less um, or maybe save that best piece for somebody else. St. Jose Maria Escriva has this to say, the day you leave the table without having made some small mortification, you will have eaten as a pagan. So you don't want to do that. Um, Third, Never complain about the food. Rather, always find an honest compliment for the chef. Once I had the honor of staying in a monastery in, in Austria, and uh, the monks there had a dining room that looked a lot like a church. It was the most elaborate dining room you've ever seen. And on the ceiling, they had various Latin proverbs uh, related to eating. And one of them was, Ad mensam sicut ad crucem. Ad mensam sicut Ad crucem. Anyone have a guess as to what that might mean? Don't cr- don't crunch your food. <laughs> Good guess. Yes. Eat very, little. Eat very little. Good guess. Literally, it says to the table as if to the cross. In other words, keep keep the important things in mind and don't don't just completely give in to barbaric festivity when we sit down to eat, but instead. Try to keep a little bit of perspective and to say, I'm going to try to eat with, with I'm, I can enjoy what I eat. I can eat enough that's going to fill me. I can even eat, you know, on a feast day or something like that, you know, to, to great satisfaction. But if I'm normally in the habit of always completely sating myself and filling up every last nook and corner, then I'm probably not taking full advantage of the opportunity I have on a daily basis to put my own desires to death and to make more room for God, which is really the whole point of silence in the first place, to make more room for God and for others inside of us. So that's the third kind of silence, which is the silence of uh, the silence of the tongue, the silence of the appetite. How are we doing? So far, so good? Somebody's wishing they hadn't taken that third piece of pizza. I guess the pizza's gone. The fourth kind of silence, don't worry, these last two are a little bit shorter, so we're going to be flying through this. Silence of touch. Silence of the hands. Many have abandoned their first love for God and have lost everything simply because they could not control their passions or mortify their sense of touch. Like all things, touch is a great gift from God. We've said this about each of the senses. Uh, Think of a father's affectionate embrace for his son or for his daughter or even for his wife. Touch is a powerful way to communicate love. We also use our hands to do our work. Um, A big principle for approaching touch, uh, for how we can be bringing discipline into this area of our life, is this concept of mortification or penance Um, in the sense of, do we always look for ways to make ourselves more comfortable? Are we constantly looking on Amazon.com to find the perfect lower back seat cushion for our 
ergonomically, you know, structured desk. I have an ergonomic desk, by the way, and I also have a foot pad on it from Amazon, both. But are we always looking for ways to make ourselves feel more comfortable? Back in the day, it used to be a common practice to wear a hair shirt underneath uh, the normal clothes. Uh, one of my favorite saints, St. Saint Philip Neri, who lived in the 1500s and who promoted holiness among the priests of that city at a time when it was in bad shape, uh, he kind of thought some of these penances in the old days were very exaggerated and silly, and so he used to wear a hair shirt on the outside instead of on the inside just to make fun of sort of the practice and so that people would think he was crazy, actually. That was truly his point. But, uh, but not that we should be wearing hair shirts, but we should seriously reflect on the fact that our Savior was born into very poor circumstances. He was born in a manger. He was born in far poorer circumstances than any of us here, I'm sure. He was born poor. He lived a very poor life. He lived a very simple and poor life. He lived a very wonderful life, of course, but poor in the sense of material. He lived a very poor life. And he died poor. He was poor all the way through. The Son of Man does not have anywhere to lay his head. Take up your cross and follow me. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. These are good things for us to think about when it comes to reflecting on how am I using my sense of touch? Am I preoccupied with my own comfort instead of thinking about the comfort of others? Some ideas for mortification from the monks. We have plenty of opportunities in our daily life to exercise mortification. You wouldn't even have to do anything different from what you're already doing to engage in mortifications. Let me give you an example. Every morning, uh, you have a clock in your bedroom or you have your smartphone or whatever it might be, and it goes off. Now, some of you are very virtuous, like Dan Betlock, wherever he is. There he is. I'm sure you get up at the first ring of your alarm clock in the morning. You probably don't even need it because that marine bugle call is still sounding in your head from boot camp from, from 20 years ago when you were in boot camp, so... But for some of us who are less virtuous, you know, it might be a temptation for some of us to hit that snooze button once or twice or more. And easy opportunity for mortification. St. Jose Maria Escrivá calls it the heroic minute, which is the first minute of the day when you make the decision, will I get up or will I snooze? Uh, easy. We don't have to do anything differently. We just have to get up when the alarm clock goes off. It's easy, and yet it's so hard a great opportunity for mortification to put our, our fallen desires to death. Uh, even taking a lukewarm shower, perhaps, instead of a hot shower on some days. I know. That's... I know. I can barely... I could barely bring myself to do it every once in a while. I don't. I don't really do it. It's too hard. But, but it's an ideal that you should strive for. <laughs> Some extra fasting on Fridays, relevant for today. We should also, in thinking about mortifications, if we are going to add something, which the church does also encourage us to add mortifying practices from time to time, especially in the penitential seasons of Advent, and especially Lent, which is coming up and is just right around the corner. A good rule of thumb, a couple good rules of thumb for mortification. One, we should avoid extremes. We should avoid extremes. There's plenty of good opportunities in your normal life. You don't have to... Do something outrageous. Um, another good rule of thumb for penances, it should be one that helps you grow in faith, hope, and love, or at least one of those. Uh, it shouldn't make you grumpier. If it makes you grumpier all the time, then it's probably not a good penance for you to do. Or in the words of St. Jose Maria Escrivá, choose mortifications which don't mortify others. <laughs> That's a good rule of thumb a good rule of thumb. So just a practical thought for that. As Lent approaches, challenge yourself with a significant mortification. But be attentive to that too. You know, if it's, if it's mortifying others more than yourself, then maybe find something else to do. There's plenty of options. So that concludes the fourth type of silence, which is the silence of touch. And the last kind of silence, which I have very little to say about, I'm sorry, second to last is the silence of smell. This is the last of the five senses. 
um, sense of smell. How could we possibly exercise the silence of smell? Well, I don't know, but something to think about, especially for maybe, I don't know, whatever, would be, you know, do I wear colognes or deodorants or other things that are intentionally designed to attract other people to me? And if I do, you know, am I aware that I'm doing that? And am I honest with myself to say, you know, am I doing this for that reason or am I doing this because this is the cheapest, you know, deodorant on the aisle and I just happen to pick it up and it says it's, you know, pheromone-infused deodorant and you're like, well, you know, whatever. But, but just sort of could, could pay attention to that. I don't know. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, you could have maybe somebody who is overly sensitive to unpleasant smells. Maybe you just got to suck it up. Maybe you're around somebody who, I don't know, whatever, just got to suck it up. <laughs> That's all I've got about smell. So. <laughs> okay. So we're approaching the end here. This is the last kind of silence that I'll talk about tonight. We, we finished the five uh, silences of the senses. The last silence I wanted to touch on is uh, maybe the silence that is most obvious to all of us, which is what we normally think of as silence, the external silence. Or quiet. External silence or quiet is a means. It's not an end. We aren't silent for the sake of being silent. Rather, we're silent to give relief to our minds and our souls and to make space for God and for our own thoughts. The monks say, No one is holy by the fact that he is not talking. Silence can even be sinful if it's lacking in brotherly love and concern. Or, for example, if we're concealing sins from our confessor, from the priest in confession. And even the strictest Carthusian and Camaldolese hermits talk sometimes. And despite all of those things which I just said, silence is a very good thing. It's not supposed to be a vacuum. It's not supposed to be just an emptiness. It's creating a space that should be filled with prayer, with work, with love, and with God. St. Jose Maria Escriva says, Silence is the doorkeeper to the interior life. Um, you know, one practical context for us here, um, the Mass, silence at church. The Mass is designed to have moments for silence, uh, for the heart to breathe. Holy Family, thanks be to God, does a great job of this. Father Joseph and Father Marcus are both very reverence in the way that they celebrate Mass, and that, that gives you that space to, you know, maybe pray during Mass, which is sort of the goal. But to have that space, to not feel like you're constantly being whipped into saying another response or to singing another song, but to just uh, be able to have some silence. I know that Scott Turkington uh, really likes to play an organ instrumental piece during communion because he likes to give people an opportunity to pray and to reflect on what they're receiving at communion without having to sing words all the time, to have a little space to just soak it in. The church should ordinarily be a place of silence. Um, perhaps one thing to consider is whether you contribute to the church's environment as, a, as both a welcoming but also a, a silent place overall. Silence in the Adoration Chapel in particular uh, you think of the the story of St. John Vianney, um, who once saw an old man praying, and he saw this old man praying in this church very often. You probably all heard this little quote, but he one day was just curious about, you know, what is this, what's the secret to this guy's prayer? He seems like he's always really deep in meditation. And so one day, St. John Vianney, the curé of ours, said, you know, what do you do when you pray? And the old man said, I look at him, and he looks at me. There's a prayer that can take place in silence that's deeper than words and that doesn't need words. It's a good thing for us to remember as a general principle that there is no right way to pray. And simply being before the Lord and the Eucharist is a great way to pray. To intentionally take some time is a beautiful token of our love that we prioritize our relationship with God enough to give him a valuable part of our week, the, the same week that he gave us all 144 hours of it. Some practical thoughts. St. Philip Neri says, Nothing helps a man more than prayer. 
the goal of external silence is to help create a space for prayer. So certainly we're all invited tonight to ask ourselves, am I spending regular time in prayer? And if prayer is something that you find time for when you have a free moment rather than something you intentionally plan, that would suggest that there might be room for you to grow and to identify even a period of five or ten minutes in the day when you can say, you know, the, after I wake up, throw my clothes on, I'm going to just take five minutes before I really do much of anything else to, to offer a couple of prayers or to dedicate the day to God, or at the end of the day, or whenever it happens to be convenient, over the lunch hour, or maybe you're lucky enough that you can get to daily Mass, or even sometimes during the week you can get to Mass. What a gift that would be. Uh, another idea, make a visit to the Adoration Chapel, even on a weekly basis if you can. The quiet that you find there is not, is not that empty quiet, but it's the presence of the Lord who will speak to your heart and give you peace. Last comments. God is necessary because, as St. Thomas Kempis says in The Imitation of Christ, nothing will ever bring you rest except being closely united to Jesus. And the last quote I have is from Cardinal Serrat, again from his book. He says, There is nothing littler, meeker, or more silent than Christ present in the host. This little piece of bread embodies the humility and perfect silence of God, his tenderness and his love for us. If we want to grow, and to be filled with the love of God, it is necessary to plant our life firmly on three great realities, the cross, the host, and the virgin. These are three mysteries that God gave to the world in order to structure, to make fruitful, and to sanctify our interior life, and to lead us to Jesus. And these three mysteries are to be contemplated in silence. Thank you, and uh, we have probably five or ten minutes for some questions, uh, or perhaps you'd like to be ironic and just let the evening end in silence, which I think would be most appropriate as well. Um, But thank you very much for your attention. Thanks be to God. Nothing helps a man more than prayer. And as I say to the school kids uh, in Shakopee, and to the parents especially who are there, I said, nothing helps a woman more than prayer either. That's sort of a lame joke, but okay. Bill. Please. You drive, you drive the public buses? Yeah. Wow. Thank you. That's a great thought. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a question. I want to your take. I've heard this question on all these radio. It starts with this adoration chapel <clears throat> for some of us, really, that <laughs> silence. <laughs> you know, true silence. <laughs> it's just everything I say. And I, I, I go every week, you know, just full commitment to that. Um, and, and it was asked, is it a sin to fall asleep? <laughs> it's like it's so quiet. You just can't help but be there. <laughs> you know, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. But I was just, I was just. It is silence. You know, yeah. it does come forth from yeah. sleep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's a sin to sleep in the adoration chapel. Um, you know, uh, as long as you don't go there planning to sleep <laughs> and not caring that you're probably going to like distract other people who are there trying to pray, but. 
I don't know. It is funny to think, though, like, when is the last time that you were in a place that was truly silent, you know? I mean, really silent. It's like, I'm never in a place that's really silent. I don't think at, all, at any point during the day, really, except, except maybe in the chapel in, my, in the rectory in the morning. But even then, there's, like, some noise, you know? It's like, we live in a very noisy world. Yes. (laughs) What if any? I didn't hear the last part of the question. I don't know who that is, but if... <laughs> was he like in the CIA and he was like in the cone of silence or something? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, thank you, John. Okay. Shall we close with a prayer? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you for the gift of all of the wonderful faculties you've given our body, the gift of sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, and the gift of a mind, eyes to enjoy the beauty that you've put around us, and so many good things. We pray that you would teach us to use your gifts well for the service to you and to our fellow man, especially to our families and to those who do not know you. We pray for all those who are in our hearts, who need you, need you more. Please help us to be those men who are strong in our relationship with you, strong in your grace, uh, strong in the Holy Spirit, so that we can be your apostles in the world, which so desperately needs it. We commit ourselves to you, O Lady, Our Lady, and the Lady of our Lord, as we pray. Hail Mary. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Loving, gracious Father, we thank you for this holy season of Advent. We ask that you give us the graces we need to always be conscious of the great gift of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to open our hearts to draw near to him, to be filled with his love. Help us to be your sign, your witness in the world around us, the truth of the gospel. May we generously and joyfully serve you in our homes and in the world. And may we build up your kingdom here on earth. We pray for the coming of that kingdom as Jesus himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Mary, Queen of Apostles, St. Joseph, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> well, thanks for coming. I know it's a busy time of year, and so I just wanted to give a couple of prefatory remarks about uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Anytime that you say we're having a lecture... 
you think of something maybe more academic. But I want us to make a distinction between information and formation. Information is data, and it's abstract. Formation is incarnational. It's concrete, and it deals with how I apply the information to my heart. So what we'd like to do uh, in this Men of God series is focus on formation. I think Holy Family is one of the best catechized parishes I've ever found. On the information level, uh, we have an incredible, uh, incredibly well-educated, uh, well-catechized parish. Formation-wise, we have not been exempted from original sin. So, formation, we've got plenty of room for improvement, right? And that's what we've got to do, is focus on how do we take everything that we know about our faith and apply it to our lives, to living that faith better, to expressing it uh, in a more full way. So with that kind of as the context for what we're trying to, to accomplish, I, I want to move into uh, the first kind of practical uh, principle uh, that's not just an application to the topic at hand, but to, to all formation, which is a business maxim, uh, something that uh, those of you out in the corporate world might have heard uh, some business guru tell you before, but I'm going to tell it to you uh, now in the setting of the church. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now, where I first heard that was an interview with the CEO of Microsoft. Okay? And uh, the new CEO of Microsoft was showing a report around their headquarters and had all sorts of zany things in their headquarters. And the reporter, business reporter said, I, you know, I've, I've never been to a corporate headquarters that had volleyball courts and, and, and all sorts of other things. Uh, you know, it's just kind of zany. And, and the CEO looked at him and said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So what they were trying to do is create a corporate culture that was creative, that thinks outside the box, that encourages individuality and uh, isn't uh, bound to, well, this is the way we've always done it, isn't bound to nine to five cubicle life. Right? So uh, what the corporate world has discovered in this maxim is something that applies a thousandfold to our living out of the gospel. Do I need to prove it? Let me ask. Does my life resemble more one of my neighbors who is not Catholic or somebody I find in Butler's Lives of the Saints? You say, oh, Father, that's maybe setting the bar a little bit too high. Except the last time I checked the church's baptismal liturgy, each and every single one of us, by our baptism, is called to be a saint and nothing less. So I think it's a fair question. Am I living the American lifestyle or the Christian lifestyle. Because they are not one and the same. There was perhaps a time in our nation where there was significant alignment between uh, the American lifestyle and the Christian lifestyle. Although even at that time, one would have to, to put the footnote that the way the Christian lifestyle was envisioned was very much a Protestant uh, vision of the gospel rather than a Catholic vision. 
But there was definitely significant alignment. But now, I think the divergence is fairly obvious. So let's ask the examination of conscience. Do I look like my neighbors in the way I spend my time? TV, Facebook and the internet, sports, the way I spend my money, house, car, cable TV, vacations? Or do the ways I spend my time and my money look like the way a saint would? That's a challenge. Who is influencing whom? Because the Christian is called to be the salt of the earth. Are we changing the flavor of the world around us? Or is the society in which we live determining what our lives look like? And I think in all humility, we'd have to say that we're far better Americans than we are Christians. Which way should the Mississippi River flow? From north to south or from south to north? Which way should this cultural influence flow? From the gospel to the world? Or from the world to the people who say they're following the gospel? You see the problem? Right? So, we have to have an honest assessment of the ways in which we have allowed the great American dream to color the way we live. And by so doing... We have absorbed a culture which is not only different than the Christian culture formed by the gospel, but nowadays, in many respects, hostile to a Christian culture. The church has had many strategies in the past 50 years to try to combat this trend of secularism in our culture. We've had pro-life strategies. We've had pro-family strategies. But the last time I checked, abortion is still legal in this nation. And if you say that marriage should be between one man and one woman, you're in risk of being accused of hate speech. So let me ask you, who is influencing whom? Where have all of the strategies all of the bishops' documents, all of the task forces, all of the committees, where have they gotten us? Because we've not tackled the culture. And, may I remind you, until you're sick of it, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's the reason we launch all these great initiatives and they go, womp, womp, womp. They fall short of the goal because we haven't allowed our lives to be shaped in such a way that we create an authentic Christian culture from which a position of strength, we engage the world in a way to be light and salt. So that's the goal. That's the goal. And that's why it's not information, but formation. It's about forming a Christian culture in our homes, in our parish, and from there to influence the world. Because we've had far too long of the world influencing us. So this has to be about more than holding certain principles to be true. An abstraction isn't going to keep me safe on dry land as a tidal wave roars by. I need something more solid. So let's talk about the ways that American culture and the church have interacted over the years. We had a good start. And we think about what the most important holidays on the American calendar are. Fourth of July, Labor Day, Memorial Day. Okay. Those are purely civic. 
But then come the religious ones. A generic religious one, Thanksgiving. Then specifically Christian ones, Christmas and Easter. And then specifically Catholic ones. You know which ones those are? Valentine's Day and and St. Patrick's Day. How could you forget? Did you and Halloween would be another one? Yes. Yes, Halloween, All Hallows Eve, the vigil of of all saints. Right? And more money is spent Halloween, St. Patrick's Day, and Valentine's, and then you throw in Christmas. Those four Christian holidays, three of them specifically Catholic, account for a massive amount of the American financial uh, sector, don't they? You know, uh, I didn't realize the full extent of this until I was uh, in my last assignment and as, as part of the, uh, the role there, I, I was involved with some civic things and one of those things, this crazy thing, there's a company called Red Bull, right? I'm, I'm not getting any money for mentioning their name tonight, okay? Um, and Red Bull did this event called Crashed Ice where they put this big ramp up by the cathedral and people go skating down and it's, it's crazy. Uh, and after the first one of these events, uh, the city council had a, a number of listening sessions with the, the neighborhoods and with the business people downtown and said, was this something that we want to do again? And the West 7th Street uh, pub keepers said, let's put it to you this way. It should be no surprise that the biggest day uh, of the year for, for us is St. Patrick's Day. And having crashed ice was like adding four St. Patrick's Days to the calendar, right? So they were pretty pleased, right? But I'd never thought of the financial impact of St. Patrick's Day. I mean, Valentine's Day, you know it, right? You see it for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Woe be to you if you don't show up with chocolates and flowers, right, for your wife, right? Uh, and make a reservation for dinner because mom shouldn't have to cook on that day, right? So the financial impact of this... So still, even today, there are ways that American culture is impacted by the church. But let's look at that. Let's be honest. When I was a kid, on the secular calendar, it said St. Valentine's Day. Look at a calendar today. It doesn't say saint on it unless it's a calendar your parish gave you. It's as simple as Valentine's Day. Saint Patrick's Day? Well, he's not Mr. Patrick yet. The Irish have kept the saint in there so far, all right? Uh, but Saint Patrick's Day, let's be clear, in Ireland, it's a solemnity and a holy day of obligation, and the people go to Mass, right? Now, in, in a classic example of what I've been talking about, about the river flowing backwards, Ireland is now having green beer on Saint Patrick's Day, something that they learned about from us, right? And they're making it a big party instead of going to Mass. So St. Patrick's Day has become the greatest occasion of drunkenness in our nation, even surpassing the Super Bowl. And Valentine's Day, all of you I'm sure celebrate in a, in a lovely way with your wives, but let's face it, it's a massive occasion of lust uh, in our country on that day. So two saints' days become about lust and drunkenness. So you see how what starts and what's, what's profoundly an impact of the church on the culture, the culture has a way of, of losing sight of the roots and letting it be twisted. And that's where we have to do some work to reclaim it. So then, I'd like to, 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 I promise we are getting to Christmas one of these days. In about 10 days, actually. Uh, but two principles that I'd like you to think about. First of all, progressive solemnity. Progressive solemnity. Right? Who here has a son who's an altar server? Okay? You ask, ask your boys. They'll tell you about progressive solemnity, because they can tell you 
on which day, you know, what's going on because of how many candles are lit in the sanctuary, because of which processional cross gets used, what color of cassocks they wear, what type of incense is burned, and which vestment the priest puts on. They can tell you exactly where we are in the ebb and flow by these externals. And that's what they're meant to do. Whether or not we have flowers in the sanctuary, whether there are lace or gold trappings around the altar, all of these things are clues that the church gives us for where we are in this progression of solemnity. Now, American culture, unfortunately, treats every day as a holiday. All right? Uh, I was appalled when the 10th anniversary of 9-11 rolled around. And really, it was treated like any other day. Right? Uh, the, they tell me that in the old days, on November the 11th, the 11th day of the 11th month, at the 11th hour, there'd be a moment of silence. And my mother said that if you happen to be in a shopping store at that time, everything in the store fell silent. And there was a pause, and there was a remembrance. Because we had a culture that recognized there were moments to be somber as well as moments to be celebratory. Now, the funny thing about uh, November the 11th is the reason why that day was Armistice Day for World War I was because it was the feast. Again, here's the church's culture. Veterans Day traces itself back to the fact that it was the feast of St. Martin of Tours, who was a soldier saint. And the Germans were ready to surrender a day or two earlier, and the French army said, no, we will accept your surrender on the 11th, because St. Martin is the patron saint of the French army. Right? So that's how profoundly this, this influence you know, goes on. But you go anywhere on November 11th today... Is there a moment of silence at 11 a.m.? No. And even on the 10th anniversary of the most horrific terroristic attack on our nation uh, since since Pearl Harbor, you know, nothing. Nothing. Life went on. Life went on. And that's where our, our culture needs to have a sense of progression. Of progression. And we don't. This is due to our affluence. Right? We live in the most affluent society in the history of mankind. Right? Which it should cause us pause when we read in Scripture that the root of evil is the love of money and that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven. It should give us all pause when we realize that we all, in terms of of, of this are rich men. Even I and a priest's salary, all right? Not, not considered rich next to Bill Gates, but considered next to the rest of humanity? Yes. Yes. So this is the problem. When, when we have disposable income, when we have confused wants and needs, I mean, how many times do you have to, to try and explain that to your kids? But I need that new toy. No, you don't. You don't need it. You want it. We live in a culture that confuses desire and necessity. What do we need? Very little. Very little. I need a roof over my head. I need a very good heater. But I don't need X number of thousand square feet. I don't need a swimming pool. I don't need all of these other things. Those are wants. And when people say to me, oh, Father, we'd love to live near church, but you know those houses are just way too small. 
said, really? Let's go back to the 1950 census and see how many people lived in each one of these houses. And I think what we discover is it's not that the houses have shrunk, it's the desires have grown. Right? So we need to be careful. Living in this affluent culture, I, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone to say that that uh, no one would really object if, if, if we classify this as a materialistic culture. And with the materialism comes a throwaway mentality. And with that comes this mentality also of every day is a holiday. Because we can afford it. We can afford it. You know, it will, it will come to the time that an Amazon drone will deliver... Uh, to your doorstep something just as the email receipt is arriving uh, from your one button push on your smartphone for having ordered the thing, you know? Uh, It's not just fast food anymore. It's instant gratification on every front. And the church is not about instant gratification. Uh, I I remember uh, when I was a fairly newly ordained priest, I was dealing with a uh, young couple preparing for marriage. And at the time, it was only 70% of engaged couples in the Catholic Church that were living together. Only 70%. Uh, and I had this talk with this young couple that I had established a good relationship with them. And I said, now we need to, to talk about how you prepare for for marriage. You know, uh, You know, living together... Are you living together as brother and sister? <laughs> Snicker. You know, they, they know father, you know? Okay, All right? Thanks for being honest, right? So I'm going to ask of you uh, that if you can't physically separate to different residences, that you abstain from sexual relations until your wedding. And the guy said, but f- f- father... It's, it's, it's six months out. Six months out. Do you know how hard that is? <laughs> His fiance kind of elbowed him. And I looked and said, six months, buddy, is a walk in the park. <laughs> okay. Right? But we live in this culture where I want it, and I want it Now. And who's going to stop me? Well, who should stop me is me. Who should stop me is me. My will. Exercising my will and not letting my passions go unrestrained. And so that's what's at stake, really. If you want to look at this whole idea of progressive solemnity, it's not just about the externals. It's not just about... Uh, window dressing. It's, it's about a sense of self-mastery. It's about a sense of, of preparation that's necessary before celebration. The other thing at stake here is rhythm. I got rhythm, you got blues. No, how does it go? I forget. Anyway, there's a rhythm that is set up that even the ancient pagans recognized, a rhythm to the seasons. They had the myth of Persephone to explain how the four seasons were at work in the world, right? Uh, that, That Persephone was the daughter of the goddess of nature, Demeter. And she gets abducted and taken to the other underworld. And finally, there's a, a truce worked out where she's restored to her mother, but only for half the year. And so the fall is when she leaves her mother, and all of nature begins to mourn. The winter is when she's away from her mother, and so the, the, nature, the world of nature is dead. And then spring, she's restored to her mother, and so all of nature buds forth a new life, and the summer is that flourishing of her being with her mother. Seasons. Even ancient pagan religions recognized a rhythm. So now, the church's rhythm is uh, on a daily basis. First of all, we have something called the Liturgy of the Hours. 
The Liturgy of the Hours is, is the prayer that all priests uh, promise to pray five times a day, and, and most sisters as well. And monks in a monastery or a cloister nuns would pray seven times a day. And that goes back to uh, the early church where Christians would stop and pray seven times a day. Every Christian. Because that punctuates the day with prayer. That throughout the whole day, I'm called back into a mindfulness of the presence of God. And that my life exists within the context of my relationship with God. And so the Liturgy of the Hours, the, the chanting of the Psalms, uh, uh, that that is the way the church uh, keeps that alive, that rhythm of prayer. And how beautiful that as as I'm saying night prayer on this side of the world, someone in the church on the other side of the world is praying morning prayer. It's this unceasing hymn of praise to God and lifting up the needs of the world. And for the lady out in the world, eventually it developed that they couldn't do the liturgy of the hours. Most of the people were not literate. So... They, they gave them how, how many psalms in the book of Psalms? 150. How many Hail Marys in the rosary as it was before the addition of the Luminous Mysteries? 150 Hail Marys. That was the layperson's psalter. That was their psalm book. Was They could pray those Hail Marys, those beads in groups of 50. And that was their way of, of sanctifying the day. And then, of course, every, talking about culture, every town, every village, every city was structured, clustered around the feet of its church. And the bells of the church would ring at dawn, and everyone would pray the Angelus. The bells of the church would ring at midday, and everyone would pray the Angelus. And the bells of the church would pray in the evening at sunset, and everyone would stop whatever they were doing and pray the Angelus. Do you know, still on Irish TV today, at 6 p.m., if you're in Ireland and you're on the TV, I forget what, it's the main TV station, state broadcasting, right? It's 6 p.m., there's nothing on the TV. Uh, they've moved away from an actual prayer, but they'll put pretty scenes up and there'll be bells ringing in the background. So if you wanted to pray the Angelus, here's a reminder on mainstream television that it's Angelus time, right? And that's a shadow of it, what it once was uh, from, from Irish Catholicism. But still even today, in the 21st century, that much at least remains. So that rhythm of the day the church wants to give us, the, with, the rhythm of the week all right, that Friday was a day of penance. Right? Now, it used to be in the early church, they fasted twice a week. You and I, under current legislation of canon law, fast twice a year, not twice a week. All right? And our fast is pretty puny. One full meal and two snacks not to equal a meal, right? That's, that's, I mean, that's not even a strict diet, let alone a fast, right? And that's twice a year, twice a year. And the early Christians fasted twice a week, twice a week. In fact, there was some discrepancy as to which days of the week that they fasted on, which is why... St. Monica, uh, when she was traveling from, from North Africa with her son Augustine, they went to Milan in, in northern Italy and met St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose baptized Augustine. Then they moved down the peninsula to the capital, uh, the ancient capital of Rome. And St. Monica writes back to St. Ambrose, says, uh-oh, i, I, I got to have your help here. I'm fasting four days a week. Because the days they fast in, in Rome are not the same days I'm used to fasting. So I'm, I'm fasting on the two days that I'm used to fasting, but I'm, then I'm also fasting on the two days that they fast here. What do I do? And St. Ambrose said, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That's where that comes from. Right? But that keeping of Friday as a day of the Passion 
right? It goes back to, to, to getting a sense of what's going on here. How many days did it take God to create the world? Six, right? And Friday is the sixth day. So Saturday is the Sabbath, the day of rest. And our Jewish brothers and sisters uh, take that as their day of rest today. When Jesus comes, he finishes his work of redemption on the same day that the work of creation was finished, Friday. He had his Sabbath rest in the tomb on Saturday. And he rose from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week. A new creation in the light of the resurrection. Sometimes they call it the eighth day because they see that is the completion of everything went before, which is why baptistries and baptismal fonts are often octagonal, eight-sided, because of the eighth day. So this rhythm of the week goes back to creation and is closely paralleled in fulfillment in the work of redemption, and then all of a sudden, we come along. And what happens? Well, when I was a kid, even the TV guide, that's before all this other stuff, there was this physical thing. You remember from the newspapers that came, it was called TV Guide, right? It had Sunday as the first day of the week in TV Guide. But now we don't think about Sunday as the first day of the week. We talk all about week end. Week end. And the way the week end usually works is Saturday's the fun day, and then Sunday, well, Sunday I do everything that I have to do before the week on Monday begins. Sunday becomes a cleanup day, chores, errands. Sunday is the biggest shopping day of the week. When I grew up, now I grew up in the South, you couldn't shop on Sunday. There'd be one gas station in the neighborhood that was open. And, and the grocery stores, some of them would be open. But even within the grocery stores, certain aisles would be roped off. You can get milk today. You can't buy magazines. You can get bread today. You can't get pet food. Fido has to wait till Monday. Now, of course, that would be sacrilege today because pets are worshipped more than, than treated better than humans. But there was an understanding. There was a profound understanding of the rhythm of the week. And we've lost that. We've lost that. Someone said very poignantly, and and I think in light of this whole discussion about culture eating strategy for breakfast, they were were onto, onto something profound that they said, When the church gave up abstinence from meat on Fridays, it lost the war. You go, really? I mean, that's one tiny little discipline. It's not even a matter of doctrine or dogma. It's one little tiny disciplinary thing. And this person made the point. When the church's arm reached all the way into the kitchen, the heart of the house, and dictated what the menu was, there was a Christian culture. There was a Catholic culture. Because if, if Holy Mother Church dictated your menu, right, and wasn't there in the heart of the house shaping things, then everything else was going to fall into place as well on this rhythm. So how do we get back to Friday being a day of the passion? Saturday, a day of Our Lady. Why? Because Mary waited in hope on Saturday for the resurrection. And then Sunday as a holy day, as a day of rest and prayer, a day for family and fun, a day for service and for those in need. But not a day like any other day. How do we get back to first Friday and first Saturday devotions where we again let the rhythm of the church be what shapes our lives. And only then does it make sense when we speak about 
Advent and Christmas, Lent and Easter. And only then will you see it makes as little sense to have a Christmas party in Advent as it does to eat chocolate bunnies and search for eggs on Ash Wednesday. The church has seasons of preparation and celebration. Preparation and celebration. Now, we have to tread carefully. The fact that Christmas carols started, by my calculations, three weeks before Advent did this year, right? Mid-November, you're already getting mainstream secular radio stations playing Christmas carols. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. Now, I'm ticked that at midnight end the 25th of December, they go and switch. But the fact that the joy of the incarnation can still switch what a pop station plays night and day for six, seven weeks, again, it tells you we still have an impact there. It's gotten twisted, but there's something there to work with. The fact that you can't, in our public schools, have a Christmas party, but that Christmas is a federal holiday. Huh. Does that ever strike you as odd? So, there's something to work with. There's something to work with. But we have to get it right. You read what the church has to say about Advent. And it's not about decorations. It's not about parties. It's certainly not about shopping. It's not about caroling. It's about prayer. It's about silence. Think about it. The sad thing is Advent is the noisiest time of year. You know? Uh, With merrymaking, it's a happy noise that, that goes on everywhere. But in the church's language, Advent is a time of silence and prayerful waiting, a time of longing and expectation, not a time of gratification. And so how do we, how do we work with this? We're not going to be able to call up I mean, I suppose if you had enough money, you could buy the local radio station and say, no, we're, we're going to do the Christmas carols from December 24th uh, through uh, the entire Christmas season, uh, but you might lose your advertisers and go bankrupt. I don't know. But how can, can those of us just uh, on the front lines here internalize these principles in our own homes even if we can't change everything going on around us. Because if we can do it in our own homes, then we've stopped the Mississippi flowing north. And it's only a matter of time before we can get it flowing south again. Now, the way that Advent is observed as preparation has a payoff in the way Christmas is observed. I mean, I have to tell you, I've seen it. December 25th at 5 p.m., Christmas trees at the curb. And you want to say, it's just beginning. It's not over. Just like Lent. If the church says fast and do penance for 40 days, the church also says, now we're going to celebrate for 50 days. But you come up to somebody in mid-May and say, Happy Easter. They look at you, what? That was weeks ago. No, it's still going on. You know, and and in Catholic cultures, the greetings change for how you see someone on the street and you say hello to them. There's a different greeting for when you're in the Easter season than the rest of the year. So how do we begin in, to internalize this ourselves so that eventually we construct 
a way to influence the culture around us rather than be influenced by that culture. Because as long as we let that culture shape us, we lose. We lose. And Christmas becomes about Santa Claus. And Easter becomes about the bunny. Instead, if we're able in our own homes to form ourselves in the right way, not being the Grinch, you know, when, when someone wishes you Merry Christmas on the street, you don't go, Happy Advent! We don't, we don't want to, we don't want to, uh, you know, turn into Ebenezer Scrooge and, and, and uh, we want to work with what's out there. We don't want to reject it, right? Uh, but at the same time, as much as we're able to control things, you know, if I own my own company, my Christmas party is going to be in the Christmas season. Not in Advent. The 12 days of Christmas, those are not the 12 last shopping days. But I think that's what people think. The 12 days of Christmas, they go from Christmas to Epiphany. So, how does the church flow? So we start in this Advent. Advent is the new year of the church. The whole cycle of meditating on the mysteries of the Lord's life begin with the first Sunday of Advent. Unfortunately for us, it usually falls in the shadow of Thanksgiving. And so we're still all having that tryptophan hangover from Thanksgiving turkey. But that's New Year's, is when Advent begins. And through Advent, there are little, little spikes there is St. Nicholas Day, you know, when children would set out their shoes. And if they were good, they might find a little treat in their shoe in the morning. So everybody knows about Christmas stockings, right? That's simply the, morph, the morphing of this custom of the Christmas shoes on St. Nicholas Day. But the gifts weren't on Christmas. In a Catholic culture, gifts were given on St. Nicholas Day. And on Epiphany, on Epiphany, did you know that in Italy there was no such thing as Santa Claus? But there was a figure called La Bifana that represented this celebration with the three kings bringing gifts on Epiphany. Those were the days for gift giving. Christmas was the day to meditate on the fact that Jesus Christ is the best gift we could ever receive. That's how a Christian celebrates Christmas. Is we, we meditate on how Jesus Christ is the best gift we could ever receive. And everything else around it needs to somehow lead us closer to that meditation and pull us away from all the stuff that could distract us. So, How could we apply this kind of progressive solemnity through Advent? You know, maybe you buy the tree at a certain point, and we'll call it an Advent bush, how about, for for the beginning stages. (laughs) And then maybe on another day, you put the lights on it. Maybe on another day, you put the ornaments on it. And then on another day, you finally plug it in. Maybe you start with your empty stable on the, on the hearth and Joseph and Mary are in the kitchen and each day of Advent they move a little bit closer and then the three kings are even further away. Maybe they start in the garage, I don't know, or the basement because uh, they're not going to arrive till January 6th for Epiphany. You know, how do we... we emphasize the sense of expectation, the sense of longing, the sense of waiting, the sense of preparation on, uh, on St. Lucy's day. The name Lucy means light. And so sometimes it's on St. Lucy's day that you flip the lights on or Gaudete Sunday. That's my personal. I won't do Christmas carols until Gaudete Sunday, this coming Sunday, because that's where the church sets aside the, the violet or purple vestments. And for that day, 
puts on rose. Please, not pink. Rose, all right? Right? So if the church says, gaudete, which is a command, it's an imperative in Latin, rejoice. So, all right, so we're getting closer to the main event. The church doesn't want us to get ground down by all that penitential preparation, so we have a little spark here on gaudete. Just like on the fourth Sunday of Lent, we have Leitare. It's again, it's a, it's a spark of, of just a, a glimmer. We're getting closer to the celebration. So for me, it's, it's, I can put on the Christmas carols from Gaudete Sunday on because the church has said we're now entering, we're so close we can taste uh, that we're getting closer to that celebration. And then when Christmas comes, whether we've used Jesse trees or Advent calendars, or of course the greatest is the Advent wreath, because you see those candles get shorter and shorter and shorter. It's sort of like the sands on an hourglass. You know, it marks time in such a tangible way that we're getting closer and closer and closer. And however you've prepared through Advent for it, when Christmas arrives, let Christmas be Christmas. Right? That, that last year or the year before, I, I forget when I read the statistic, was the first time the first time in in American Catholic history more people went to Christmas mass on Christmas Eve than on Christmas Day and I got a problem with that because unfortunately for a lot of people it's get it out of the way with but the idea that we're now on a trend that will someday see almost no one at Mass on Christmas. What does the word Christmas mean? The Mass of Christ. Christ Mass. That's where the very word comes from. But a couple of years ago in Chicago, at a mega church in Chicago, Christmas fell on a Sunday. So what did they do? They sent all their... Their members, uh, tens of thousands of you know members in this mega church, they sent them all a DVD and said, "We're we're not having services this year. Just you enjoy your family time and plop in this little DVD with a with a a peppy little message at some point whenever it's convenient for you." That's where we're already at. You thought it was bad that Target was opening on Thanksgiving evening. We, we're, we're a lot further down river than that. So it is that, that when Christmas comes, the mass, the celebration, the celebration of Christ's birth by the perpetuation of his incarnation in the Holy Eucharist. That's right. The Holy Eucharist is this whole mystery of Christmas right here given to us. Right here given to us. And then maybe if we have free time during those days of the Christmas season, instead of sleeping in, maybe we go to Mass. Because that's the way to celebrate Christmas is by coming and being with Jesus whose birth we've celebrated that he came to be with us. So we're going to make an effort to be with him. In those first days of, of the Christmas season, what we call an octave, just like an octave on a piano, it's eight, like those, that eight-sided baptismal font, right? The eighth day. So, so any of you see the movie Groundhog Day? Okay, then you understand what an octave is, all right? And an octave in the church's liturgical year is Groundhog Day. You're stuck. Okay, wait a minute. You get up the next day, and we're doing yesterday all over again. And you get up the next day, and we're doing yesterday all over again. For eight days, it's, it's like in those days when we had record players, and they would skip, and they would get stuck, 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 and then you have to swat the... The, the needle and hopefully not scratch the record and you, you, you get it going again. That's what an octave is. The church says this is so important. We're not just going to keep on moving. We're going to pause and savor 
for eight days. Pause and savor. Just soak up the moment. You talk to uh, a sports player that's just won uh, a big game. Maybe you see him on TV, Super Bowl, they've just won, and just they're on the field and they just don't want to leave the field. Because they know as, as soon as they go to the locker room, yeah, there's, there's, there's more celebration that's going to come and all that. But I just want to stop and soak up this moment. I want to live this experience. I don't want it to end. That's what the church is doing in an octave. Take that joy of Christmas. Take this beautiful reality of the Son of God made man, of the Savior of the world born to free us of our sins and open for us the way to eternal life. And wow, how do you just keep moving past that? And the octave of Christmas is unlike other octaves. Sadly, now there's only one other octave left, Easter. But you know, Easter's octave trumps everything. Nothing comes into it. Even a solemnity. Uh, you know, if Easter was really early, Holy Week and, uh, and Easter Week trump everything. The reason why Pope St. John Paul II's feast day is not on his death day, which is the normal day for a saint's feast day, is they realize that nine times out of ten, it would fall during Holy Week or Easter week, and it would get trumped. Uh, and so they said, no, let's put it on the anniversary of his pontificate, and that way we'll get to celebrate it every year because, because these octaves trump everything. But Christmas's octave is a little bit peculiar in that December 26th is the second day in the octave of Christmas and the Feast of St. Stephen. Oh, how did that saint sneak in there? I, th- I mean, John Paul II is a pretty great guy. and He couldn't sneak into the Easter octave. How does Stephen sneak into the, the Christmas octave? Because Stephen is the first martyr. Hmm. Do you see how Mother Church moves immediately from that joy of the birth of the Savior and immediately to the first martyr? Huh. Why? Because it's the joy of knowing our Savior and his love for us that makes us willing to shed our blood for the gospel. It's not a set of abstract intellectual principles that we shed our blood for. Okay, and then the 27th of December, the third day in the octave of Christmas and the Feast of St. John. Well, now how did he sneak in there? He's the beloved disciple. He's the one who rested on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. He's the only one of the apostles not to be martyred. And he's there to show us that intimacy with Christ in the Eucharist. There he was with Christ at the Last Supper. And then he was not martyred so he could be that link to tell the generations to come. And then on the 28th, the fourth day of the octave of Christmas, and the Holy Innocents. Those children from Bethlehem who were born around the same time as our Lord, but by order of Herod, were massacred as he tried to get our Lord. And we honor them right around the birthday of our Lord. And it reminds us of the sanctity and dignity of human life. And then the 29th, we're still in the octave of Christmas, but we get another saint, St. Thomas Beckett. And now wait a minute. Okay, all right. Here we got, I can go, I can get Stephen, I can get John, I can get the Holy Innocence. We're, we're all scriptural there. They're all... Uh, closely related to Jesus, who is this medieval bishop saint and how did he cram into this octave of Christmas? Well, in the Middle Ages, 
there were four great pilgrimage shrines. Jerusalem and Rome, Santiago de Compostela in Spain, the shrine of the, the uh, Apostle St. James, and Canterbury. Ever hear of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales? Those are pilgrims on their way to pray at the tomb of St. Thomas Becket, whose feast we celebrate within the octave of Christmas. Why was he so special? Why did he catapult up to the top ranks? He represents the church's perennial struggle between church and state. Thomas Becket was the bishop who opposed King Henry II of England, uh, who tried to make the church uh, under the thumb of the government. Which is why when another King Henry, six Henrys later, Henry VIII, when he decided that the church was coming under his thumb, one of the first things he did was go to Canterbury and destroy the tomb of St. Thomas Becket. And so St. Thomas Becket is right here, providentially placed in the octave of Christmas. And I think he becomes a reminder to us who's influencing whom. Are we going to give the culture around us the upper hand? Or are we going to stand firm and we're going to be the ones that influence the culture around us. This is the perennial struggle between the church and the world. From these days of the octave, the octave concludes on January 1st, the secular new year, when we honor Mary, Mother of God, because Mary is the beginning of, of redemption. We celebrated her immaculate conception She's conceived without sin because she is the pathway through which salvation comes to the world. So she's our new beginning. And then we go on to Epiphany with the three kings, which represent the pagan world, the whole world, the corners of the world. Tradition said that one of the kings came <clears throat> from Asia, one from Africa, and one from Europe. Uh, that, that they represented the continents all coming together. But it's the pagan world. It's not the chosen people of Israel. The salvation is for the entire world. And that's the 12th day of Christmas. That this joy of the birth of the Savior is a joy that should be for the whole world. Someone should write a song about that. Joy to the world. Oh, yeah, they did. Okay. And then the Christmas season used to continue all the way to February 2nd, Groundhog Day. <laughs> but if you open up the Roman Missal on the altar, it won't say February 2nd, Groundhog Day. It'll say February 2nd, the feast of the presentation of the Lord in the temple. Because the completion of the Christmas season is this remembrance of Jesus in fulfillment of the old covenant that said that the firstborn male has to be dedicated to the Lord, has to be presented, and there has to be a sacrifice that's made. A couple little birds. The SPCA would not be happy. But that, the mass begins on that day you're supposed to, with a procession and a blessing of candles. It's called Candle Mass, the Mass of the Candles. And it was 40 days from Christmas to Candlemas. And all those 40 days were of celebration. And still today, we read at the beginning of the Mass, it has been 40 days since we celebrate the birth of our Savior. There's still this continuity and so maybe what we can do, don't keep your trees up. It'll be a fire hazard. But maybe at least, at least we can do little things to perpetuate this joy of Christmas. Maybe for the 12 days of Christmas, you space out the kids' Christmas gifts. Give them one on Christmas, one the next day, whatever, to, to, to get, create this sense of, of celebration. Because 
Don't let go of the joy of Christmas a minute sooner than you have to. But we're much better. You know, when we think of this, it's so funny. Catholics are really good at Lent. We're really lousy at Advent. We're really lousy at Christmas. And we're really lousy at Easter. Lent, we do really well. Why is it we do penance better than celebration? But we need to start doing that. It's one thing to say, this is a season of preparation and, and we're going to try to not get swept up in the, in the tidal wave around us of, of the way the world is, is, is treating this time. But it's perfectly within my capability to construct how I celebrate from December 25th for those 12 days and then some way keep alive that joy all the way to February 2nd. Even if it's just that in your homes, after everything else has been taken down, the nativity scene stays there until February 2nd. And every night when you say your family prayers, you gather around that nativity scene and just have that remembrance that we're still basking in the afterglow of the celebration of our Savior's birth. So that's what I'd like to tell you is at stake in, in how we use our time, how we let the church and these celebrations guide us. And there's a richness to be found, but it's a challenge. It's hard to celebrate for 12 days. And not to celebrate in a way that's simply self-indulgent, because that's not a very holy celebration. But it's worth the effort to discover how to celebrate. And by getting this right, we start to reverse the whole way that culture is influencing us or we're influencing the culture around us. Because culture eats strategy for breakfast. So let's make sure it's our culture. Thanks for your attention. God bless you.